listening to The Downside. The Downside. With John Marco Cerezi. <laughs> Welcome to The Downside. My name is Gianmarco Cerezi. I am in the Spotify studios in Los Angeles. This is, this is, uh, they, thank you, Spotify, for this. Um, uh, Russell is not here because I'm in LA. And uh, whenever I'm here, I try to, I try to, Get someone who I can't always get in New York. We'll introduce her later, but she's here. Hello. Hello. I uh, I, I told her I like this mystery intro thing. And I have stuff to complain about. I'm very annoyed. Oh. I'm very upset. I uh, This is all, all, all public. I'm not going to say names, but you can track it down. There is basically, uh, you know, uh, w- w- with Israel and Palestine, there's certainly been a, a lot of liberals who all agreed on a lot of things all at once. Suddenly have something new that's quite contentious. Bottom line is, uh, there was a comedian, Jeffrey Asmus, who is one of my, who I think one of the most talented comics. Do you know Jeffrey? I don't think I do. Oh, you, you love okay. his jokes. Just okay. a brilliant, really? brilliant, dark, smart joke writer. And um, basically, he called out a booker of a, of a particular comedy club in, in New York of... of, of, of uh, Ill repute to a degree. <laughs> well, that uh, could be any, actually. <laughs> sure, but but w- certainly one of the ones leaning towards the bringer shows okay. and the, ultimately the Booker performing quite a lot. Okay. I I never seen a Booker slash comic work in theory. <laughs> a club Booker. I'm sure you've seen many versions of the Booker slash comic. It's tough. I mean, um, I understand taking the job, you know, uh-huh. and I, cause uh, I want my spots, so I get it, but it's, I think, uh, it's a lot of work, uh, that you probably aren't expecting and it probably cuts into your ability to perform to your best. I've always said, if you, if you want to make a lot of, become a Booker, if you want to make a lot of friends quick and enemies over time, because <laughs> forever, <laughs> you can't, I, I don't, I don't know. It's, it can't be a fun life to be a Booker because I think a lot of Bookers <sighs> want to be uh, friends with comics. Yeah. And that's one thing I yeah. think for them to be, basically everyone's treating you differently because they want to be booked right. in, at your club. Yeah. And, uh, it's really hard to maintain. If you've ever booked a weekly show or a monthly show, you really kind of start to conceive of how many people are asking you on a yeah. daily basis. That's one thing I like about Patrick from the stand is he just moved to another state, so he doesn't. Sure. He, does, he just uh, does it via email and uh, has no contact. I'm glad you like that about Patrick. It's also impossible for me to get up in front of Patrick <laughs> to get past at the stand. But you see, that's the point. <laughs> right, is right, it's right. Like it, it's for so, every Booker has some comics. Who would who would credit them with with so much and another series of comics that w- would I know. just go they never I know so it, we n- none of us hate the same bookers and yes. n- none of us love the same bookers yes right and uh but this this is beyond that that's that's one thing and if you're an adult you can conceive of me not me not working at the stand I, I don't. This is a different. So it's their loss. You would you would crush. You. They you. would love you. I, have, I can't believe it I hasn't before, happened yet. <laughs> but uh, but this this was worse. Where so basically this Booker was was really going hard in the paint with uh, what I would call. I'm going to try to be a non biased about this part. Uh, propaganda and ultimately some that was quite Islamophobic. Just really just brutal. Right. In in terms of what was said, and and listen, a lot of people they were they were they were passionate. They mm-hmm. Post a lot of things, mm-hmm. and um, uh, Jeffrey Asmus uh, basically kind of called them out on 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 social media to a degree and said, "I will no longer be working this club." And it came out via a podcast that they all did together that this Booker had written, um, uh, uh, the seller had written uh, no. Okay. At the cellar. And this is all public, so I'm not this yeah. was in a podcast. Yeah. I uh, I uh, basically saying like I was disappointed to see Jeffrey still booked at this club. Oh. Uh given blah 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 and and I I believe the words were um harassing, even though it's like a post on an Instagram and and being pro Palestinian. And to me, it offends me on so many levels. Right, right, right. One None of us are making enough money at these clubs that that to mistreat us. You know, I'm just sensitive. Yeah, right, right. This it's a very precarious position. It's so hard to work these clubs. It's so hard to maintain a career. 
And when people are working secretly behind the scenes and doing something like this, and listen, if it's for a reason of this comedian uh, uh, blocked the door and jerked off in front of me, sure. I was just going to say, or if, I, I can see complaining about a rapist or a pedophile or a Which sex offender. Which rarely is the case. And it's never the case. <laughs> it's like uh, contacting you. Can I get that guy's number? Uh, yeah, 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 yeah. It's, it's like that kind of behavior, definitely. But when it's it's material or this kind of stuff, uh, Well, the thing that we're supposed to do. Sneaky. The thing we're yeah. supposed to do, and I, I think this is part of we, we, we're the way that we talk about political disagreements or being comics are supposed to do this. Yeah. And that's what tough crowd was, by the way. It yeah. was everyone smashing in with their opinions that uh, often were either ill informed or just loud or something. And the, as some kind of and Colin moderating, you know. Did you ever feel, because you wrote for Tough Crowd, did you do a lot of episodes as well? I did a few, but not a ton. Was there, when you look back on it now, see, I, I, I by the way, I'm here with Lori Kilmartin, a phenomenal stand-up comedian, uh, a writer, most uh, recently uh, wrote for Conan for many years, mm -hmm. but also uh, I, I like your work so much because it is... It is it is the balance, and I think the struggle of being generally progressive, but edgy, mm -hmm. and the struggle of I'm sure you struggle with uh, not trying to um, pander and not try to like just hey we all agree like but still to be offensive but not hurtful. I don't even know what words to use. I don't know. I'm I want to be annoying and still get a laugh. Yeah. Um, do you ever you ever have any jokes that like we're getting applause and you're like, oh, and now everyone just we all agree. Yeah, we all agree with the thing. Yeah. No, they don't applaud my jokes. That's not true. <laughs> you said uh, what, what was it about trans women and in the special that that I just saw? Oh, yeah. Yeah. That that uh, oh, that joke. Um, I, it's like it's out of my head now. But yeah. Um, I love trans women and uh, uh, their fresh troops in the war against the patriarchy. They know a lot of things we cis women don't know because they lived in both worlds. Like they know how much we're supposed to get paid. Yeah. That's valuable information. Tag, 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 tag. I think what I what I love about your work that that I I try to do, I think, is is you have the progressive view for the wrong reason. <laughs> You know what I yeah, mean? Yeah, right. Like, it's no, it's very selfish. It's always because yeah. it benefits me. Yes. Yeah. Same with parenting. Like if I do the right thing, it's accidentally, but I often do the wrong thing because I, for, yes. Sure. I feel like most of my jokes make me look like a narcissist and yeah. they should. You know? uh, yeah, of right. course. I love, I just love narcissists. I mean, <laughs> I, I was a Seinfeld to Larry Day. Yeah. <laughs> so, so this, this, uh, this book I wrote. Um, just saying, disappoint to see this person on your lineup. And it's, it's, and also as a Jew, there's this degree of like, <laughs> and this was happening with UTA firing people and all these people firing yeah. people expressing pro Palestinian views, where I'm like, guys, do we remember the stereotype of Jews running Hollywood? If you are actively uh, uh, making that true and using your power, uh, unethically and secretively and and Jew to Jew, you are contributing to the overall picture of of this thing. I had a I had a a meeting with a rep and I'm ultimately not with that rep and someone came up to me after an older person was like and was like, so Israel, uh, how do you talk about that on stage? And I and I felt like I know what you're saying right now. Yeah. You are you're looking for you're you're talking to me about something very not part of this meeting, and yeah. this is bad. Yeah, Jew to Jew, this is bad. Right, right, right. So I hated this on so many levels. I I I called out this person. I didn't like the way they practiced this club to begin with because they took over from another booker, um, and ultimately kind of implanted themselves as the the host at a time when I was like hosting once in a while. So there's no no. This is my selfish reasons. It was just less money. Mm -hmm. And it was a weird thing of like, you're taking over this club to give yourself host spots. You're one of the hubs of the city. Yeah. You are breaking down the system of a of a healthy environment for comics to build and grow. But I survived. It was fine. Yeah. And then... <laughs> healthy system is always debatable when it comes to stand-up comedy sure. and how we grow. But yes, I see what you're saying. Sure. None of the systems are good, but I think there's certain scenes that like... 
there's poison and yeah. there's clubs that are working a little bit better and yeah. a little bit worse. Yeah. Um, I as someone who worked at LOL for three years, four <laughs> years, five years, I mm -hmm. you know, mm -hmm. um, we made a whole episode about it and we like censored everything and then it closed. So now it's like, oh, we can just talk <laughs> publicly talk shit about this. But um, the last thing I'll say is that this 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 person as a booker, when you're a booker of a club in yeah. New York, you get to go to a lot of the cool events. Mm -hmm. And I saw them. This is very bitchy of me. Uh, they they came up to me at, at JFL at one of the cool galas with all the cool people mm -hmm. I, and said, you know, being here makes me realize I'm not good enough to do this professionally as a hobby. That's great. But, you know, I think I think I'm, uh, I'm uh, going to book and run a comedy club. Huh. And I and I could feel that politeness in me. Wanting to go, no, and I, I held is that, strong. Is that what they were asked, waiting for? So, <laughs> a week later, this this video pops up on on my Instagram, and it's a, a clip they're doing on stage where they go like, "So, I talked to a comic recently and said like I should quit stand up comedy. I'm not good enough." And they didn't say anything. And I'm and I'm and I'm watching it. And I'm going, "Oh my god, oh my god!" And then they keep going with more details, and I'm like, "Oh, this isn't about me. It's about someone else." <laughs> You have been doing this to multiple comedians. All of them have been silent. Oh my god! And so that is so strange. Yeah. You ever have a club stop working with you? Oh yes, yeah. What, I mean, what reason specifically? No one ever tells you. Uh, yeah, that's that's the thing. They don't tell you. That's you why when it's public, I'm like, call it out because yeah. you rarely get to see this thing. And this is like a, a text was read and acknowledged by the person who sent it. So it's like. Then you can't you can't be a booker then, right? How was it resolved? Was it? Uh, they they did a show together. I mean, it's it's. I don't think it was resolved in the sense of uh, Jeffrey Asmus doesn't need to work this yeah. club, right? 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 I don't think he he did really. Yeah. So it was fine, and and uh, Gnome uh, just very publicly like doesn't doesn't let himself be influenced by public opinion or by yeah. like that. Yeah. For whichever which way, you know, he's he's engaged publicly as as an owner of a comedy club, and that's yeah. kind of his take. Yeah, and I think that's good. Mm -hmm. I admire that to a degree. Yeah. Um. Oh, Salori. So, yeah. So, so good to see you. You have a special out. I do. Um. Uh. But by the way, for people joining, this is the downside. If you're a fan, join the Patreon. Patreon.com/slash downside. Bonus episodes, live episodes. Um. My clean comedy special, The Rats Are in Me. And uh, this is a place where we complain. This is a place where we don't have to be positive or thankful. We can just bitch and moan and talk shit. And as I'm doing right now, yeah. and as I think when you're, when I'm in LA, I suddenly, you see New York with clarity and you're yeah. like, yeah, fuck that. <laughs> and then you go back and I'm like, oh, fuck. Of course. Oh, no. Now I want to, now I want a spot at Westside Comedy Club. Yeah. Oh. Uh, so, <laughs> uh, <laughs> you started. In San Francisco. I did. Yeah. In 87. In 87. Yes. Please don't tell me that's when you were born. I get it. No, I'm old Lori, and I've been around a long time. What the fuck? Um, uh, that's funny. So, it's not. It's actually very hurtful. Mm, you, what was it like? Well, how, how, how was stand up different? In 87, in that era, like breaking in, were there less comedians? Way less comedians. Yeah? Way less comedians, yeah. I mean, it felt like a lot at the time. Like at the Holy City Zoo, which is like the the kind of iconic San Francisco club that mm -hmm. everyone kind of went to when you started. Um, you would have like maybe t uh, 25 people on open mic night. Okay. And that's not a lot anymore. No. You know? Um, and that was everybody. You just yeah. had to show up before I think eight o'clock, and then she would put you on the she would put you on a list, and you hoped you were early rather than late. But that was it. And you you so you you studied drama for six months at UCLA. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and did you did you just hate acting? No, it, I wasn't even. I mean, it was just I was barely doing the prerequisites. I was uh, sure. I had other stuff going on. That's you know possibly a dramatic special what? a one person show what I don't want to get into it okay but dropped out uh -huh. and was gonna go back i was like i just need to get my shit together i had an eating disorder right uh -huh. so i'm like let me just fix that my mom did too oh okay so i thought it would be a quick 
fix. <laughs> but I'm still working on it. Um, sure, sure. But uh, at the time, I was like, I'll, I'll go back next year. And then I didn't. And I started, uh, you know, trying other things. And I, I stumbled into stand-up comedy at some point. Um, and that then I was like, oh, this is it. And But did it seem like stand-up comedy – even though it is difficult in the sense that it's oversaturated, the path is more clear. You go, oh, this is how you can make money. You can do some social media. You can do this. Like back then, did it seem like this is a viable career path? No. To me, at that at that time, I'm like, if I could just figure out how to kill, then I would have everything. Because I was so uncomfortable speaking, public speaking, mm -hmm. um, and the idea that you would write your own joke and then it would work. And yeah. like the whole process was so much to me, you know? Yeah. And uh, the idea, I thought if I could just kill, figure out how to kill, then I could, that, that would be enough. And then I'll figure out what I want to do. <laughs> um, was with killing my life. back then softer than what killing is now? No. Let me tell you something. When I was starting, Dana Carvey was working comedy clubs. Yeah. That guy murdered so hard uh, on Brian Regan levels. Yeah. Like early Brian Regan, you know? Uh, Donut Lady Brian Regan. Sure, he, sure. Because he did all of the characters they ended up doing on SNL, a lot of them. He just did them without, obviously, any makeup. He would just switch his, you know, move his face around and move his posture around. And, and back had, then you could play different races and get a real big pop. Uncle Carlos was he. I I don't think he has an uncle Carlos. He's from uh -huh. San Carlos, maybe. I you know what? I have no idea. Maybe you could ask him one day. But it was Scarface, basically. Uh -huh. It was him doing uh, Al Pacino pretending to be Cuban. So it was yeah. like two levels of. <laughs> to be fair, Al Pacino was also pretending. Yeah, to be yeah, Cuban exactly. For Scarface, exactly. So yeah, so uh, so he had that. He had that guy, and then his brother Scott who was, uh, you know, looking back, an autistic psychopath in his act. Uh -huh. And uh, the church lady, somehow they all came over for dinner. Like, he would have them individually in his act. He'll, he would do a little bit. And then this is how he closed. And he would bring all the characters over for, like, Thanksgiving dinner. And they were, started interacting with each other. And people could h hardly breathe. They were laughing so hard. That's so that, wild. to me, I was like... How is this? How is this one person? He's so tiny, Dana Carvey, uh -huh. right? He's like five seven, weighs a hundred pounds, and at that time he was so young, like he looked like a child. Mm -hmm. And I'm like, how can this guy create this? And I kept, I kept seeing him. I would follow him all over the Bay Area to different clubs, foo bars, uh, the Punchline, Rooster Teeth, Feathers, and it was the same all the time. Yeah, the way he destroyed, and I was, I, it was, it, it's still, it's, I rarely see it. Was it I? Because I my not theory, but but when sketch and improv came along, I feel like it created a home for charactery stuff, and in a way, like stand up lost. Like I feel like if Jim Carrey had been alive in my era, he would have just become a UCB sketch comedian. He never would have done stand up comedy clubs. And I feel right. like there's been this separation. I think that's true. I have some character. Uh, my co-host uh, uh, Russell Daniels is a really, I mean, just a brilliant. Uh, sketch performer yeah and i don't know if he'd do stand up but i think he'd be so good and it's just you don't have that anymore yeah there are very few people who really do a full-on character anymore or wh the what you're describing yeah three characters coming back for th if they did that unless it was amazing we would yeah. judge it immediately i think so too um uh yeah like i was i used to do i used to do my ex-boyfriend who was russian so i had a russian accent oh, yeah. yes ready to go at all times. And uh, I would do my mom, you know, and then uh, when I moved to New York, uh, a comic, a female comic said, Letterman hates it when women comics do their mom. <laughs> so I was like, oh. all right, dropping, dropping it. And then I started doing my boyfriend uh, quite a bit on stage. And then I don't know, it, I guess now it doesn't feel necessary for a white comic to do any accent, even a white accent. You know what I mean? Sure. I'm so bad at it. Yeah. I'm so bad at impressions that sometimes I'm like, thank God. Because I <laughs> then I'd have to navigate what to do. You would be here. so tempted. I saw I'm not gonna name a name. I saw a comic recently and they they were someone on TikTok. They saw basically a disabled person on TikTok talk about making fun of their disabled sister. And within <laughs> their dis and it's a very funny, it's a very funny concept. And but basically they did they did a disabled person on top of a disabled person. And it was it was offensive because it was so accurate. And it was just just a thing of uh 
I can't, I not able to do that. So I don't have to uh, challenge myself with the question of when is it good enough right. to get away with the thing? Well, I have noticed like, like first generation comics, like, it, you know, in, in the nineties, you did your mother's accent, right? Like mm-hmm. that was a very common thing for uh, comics who who came here for wherever or joe coy at the osp at the golden globes <laughs> he slipped it in in that first two minutes i was like you <laughs> son of a bitch he's he, he, the moment he said i remember as a kid my mom would and i was like ah oh, here we go yes well we could talk about him in a sec but like i i think now that's almost when i read people like critiquing comedy and, and it's comics maybe within those circles they think it's almost making, you know, like we, you don't do that anymore as much. You mm-hmm. Do your mother's accent or do your like kind of make, you know, sort of make making fun of it. I, I, again, that's not my world, but that's what I've observed. And it just seems comedy just moves so quickly, you know, different places. It, I think like, when you see Maria Bamford do it, it's so astounding uh, of a transformation. That yeah. It, I just think, again, I do have sometimes I, I, I worry that I have a lot of. I write a lot of scenes in my stand up. There's right. a lot of like yeah. just line to line to yeah, line. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And I'm not a good impression. I mean, I wish I was. And so it's more about the intention. And yeah, that's right, you know, right. that's my limitations and I operate within it. Maria, so like she she cha- she changes the character so completely, but it's so it's so little movement. Mm-hmm. You know, like she doesn't like go crazy with the face or anything like that it's just like a few just turns in her body but they're so precise yeah um that to me it doesn't feel big but sometimes when people like make a big deal about the you know they stand differently or you know it's like all right you took acting classes or something yeah you know um it and it seems a little more cartoony than uh what we what comedy seems to be going towards now which is is less less of that a great a great deal less of that sure sure um so you 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 know it's my my mom uh who seems to like stand up like she really or is she like she's uh gotten into it since i really got into it it's been nice you yeah know, she goes and sees stand up on her own oh nice but something she how old is your mom she, uh she is i believe she's older than me that's all i wanted to know <laughs> god if i get that wrong i'm so fucked she listens to this fucking podcast god damn it she looks great fantastic mm-hmm. um <laughs> I believe you. Uh, we got I, some oyster company. I I kept wearing their shirt. I got it at like a vintage store. Yeah. And they sent 50 oysters to my mom's house today. It's one of those things that's cool, but now we have 50 oysters. Do you have even 25 friends to invite over? Basically, I'm going to go back to the place. I, in 10 minutes, me and my two openers tonight for Irvine are going <laughs> to just eat these oysters. Probably throw up on the way. Yeah. Um, She, my mom hates normally yeah she goes i hate when comedians talk about their kids yeah and i don't i don't think she's you know what i think she saw you actually a long time ago but she wouldn't remember the exact but i remember there's a feeling of like oh you'd like yeah what you're talking about with your kids i because to her she goes like i don't want to hear about putting on diapers i feel like she's seen a lot of bad parent right right kid right. comedy well i i feel like when it's actually about the kid that's what that's when people check out. But mm. when it's about you being terrible at it, you know, even indirectly, I think that's a little more interesting. You know, so many comics have the. So my three year old the other day he said, "Bitch, where's my Cheerio?" Like there's so my three year old said cunt, and yeah. that's the joke. Yeah, is that they said, and sometimes they said something too complex, and you're like, they did not. I know they did it's, not it's, say that. It's like that tweet where the woman said her daughter with it's the Ruth Conda yes! forever. Yeah. Uh huh. Like, uh, mommy, no great. more kids in cages. I think that was Adina Menzel <laughs> yeah. who said that. Oh my god! Can you imagine a three-year-old saying, "Mommy, no more kids in cages"? <laughs> they would say, "Mommy, more kids in cages." If they said anything like that, they yeah. said, "Mommy, I want to try the cage." That sounds fun. <laughs> um, when you had a kid, what year was that? Two thousand six. Two thousand six. Did you, uh, in your head? Talking about your, I talk a lot of shit about my parents, and I'm lucky in the sense that they don't care. Maybe I'm unlucky that they don't care because they're they're not involved. I don't know. Yeah, but I I talk about my family free range. What was it like when your son was of an age where he could go, "Hey, you talked about me masturbating." 
that's that's embarrassing. Well, sometimes I I mean I try to word it so like I have a bit about my son being circum. What what. I have a bit about thinking about circumcision and uh-huh. contemplating it, right? But I never say in the bit if I did circumcise my son or not. And so I kind of – I try to leave it a little vague like that. So I love people walking around, well, is, is her son circumcised or not? What a mystery. <laughs> That's – you'll have to listen to his podcast in 10 years. Um, Can I tell you? Some, yeah. some people, parents, they come on my podcast and they're like – they want to cut something out that's like sexual and they go, I don't want my son listening to that someday. And I want to grab him and say, your son is never going to fucking listen to you on a podcast. Are you out of your mind? Are you out of your mind? Your son's going to be sitting around like, let me go listen to my my dad do a podcast from 20 years ago, see what his thoughts were. Never. Especially because if you are a comic, if your child has so much video of you they can access, they're never going to get through it. Like if I had one you know, my dad had appeared on a podcast. It would have been one in, in 2012, and I would listen to it over and over again because that would be the only time he'd ever done it. Uh-huh. But we are putting out so much shit. Yeah. Our kids are really just going to try to get away from us and get our voices out of their heads instead uh-huh. of dive into them after we're dead. Yeah. I like, I once in a while, I'll Google, uh, once I Googled like my mom and dad. Because they got divorced when I was a baby. Yeah. So it's just like it's something, an article about them, their marriage. Yeah. I was like, oh, interesting. But that was it. Yeah. Right, I've right, right. I've seen the photo album once. Right, right, if right. If there was a video, uh, maybe I'd watch it for a second. But yeah. a podcast? Get out of here. Oh, my God. No. Um, so did, did your did your... Did your son ever say I did your son ever have a problem with any joke? Did he ever go? No, he, he I, I always I I told him, you know, I, I start with the truth and then I make stuff up, mm-hmm. you know, and he's he seems to like be OK with that. Like he goes on the road with me and he'll watch stuff. I saw him at JFL. I, I oh, that's him. right. Yeah. 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 Um, but I, I did have a joke that would have him in the joke masturbating. Right. Uh-huh. <laughs> and so I, I said to him, I go, hey, there's a joke I. You know, it's working pretty well. I mean, it's a dick joke, right? So it's going to work. Yeah. I mean, it's hard to give up a nice, solid laugh. Sure. But I said, I'm doing a joke about you. I don't, I don't know if you <laughs> like it. I just can't imagine my mom ever having to have that conversation with me. Well, he's he's 17, too. So uh-huh. this is not anything you ever wants to discuss with me. And, uh, and he goes, well, what's the joke? And I go... <laughs> Because I have told, like, for him, he's like, wait, I've heard so much shit. If you don't want, if you don't think I'd like sure, it, how bad sure. is this? And I go, watch you watch it tonight? Because we were at the Sacramento Punchline. And he goes, I think if you can't tell me now, maybe you shouldn't do the joke. Wow. That's and mature. I was like, that's yeah, mature. I was like, that's, that's correct. So I'm going to wait till he moves out. Because <laughs> uh-huh. you can't give up a good dick joke, uh, Gian Marco. My first, the, the, this is weird, but my first girlfriend... Or my first girlfriend, who we ended up having sex with the first time. I remember in the beginning, I was like, so uh, do you want to? And she said, if you can't say it, I don't think (laughs) you're ready for it. (laughs) True. And I'm like, that was very wise and true. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And I was like, do what the fuck? (laughs) Um, Yeah, I just, I hear some people who go, my sister doesn't want me to talk about them. or, Or, you know, if you had a son who said, I I don't like being talked about. It would, it would be oh devastating. That would be tough. But I, I can see a child saying that if you have violated their boundaries and and sure. like said, you know, done, is, is, you know, kind of like that. I just the, I read a tweet somebody said about how they're they're starting to talk to kids of mommy bloggers. I saw the same. Tweet. Oh yeah, I'm sure our feeds are. Very I'm similar. sure I have more videos of people dying suddenly. And <laughs> you like that tweet today? Well, every time I go on Twitter right now, it is there's there's a video of someone dying. Oh my god, I know. And I I always watch it. <laughs> did there's you watch that, the head video? I, I was didn't. Just about to, it. So so uh, this is coming out a little later. Uh, I'm sure the news will have completely moved on because this is now yeah just standard. Some uh, guy whose dad worked for he was a government yeah federal employee federal employee <laughs> cut off his dad's head and made a long YouTube video where he presented the head in a bag. God and dang! And then talked about how Biden is destroying the world and and now we go through the cycle of everyone will say it's a or the right will say it's a psyop and all these things. Yeah. And again, I saw it. I saw the tweet saying this had happened and YouTube had left it up. And I go to the replies, and I'm like, I know what I'm doing. Oh, I know what I'm doing. <laughs> right. 
and I know it's bad, and I know it will do something deep in my brain. Right. And I saw it for a second, you know, and and I closed it, and I was like, God. Was the I... father alive when he started, or no? Okay. All I saw, I, I believe it was just it was just a you know typical vlog. But at some point, he just brings it. It was in a bag, oh. and it, it was it was obscured. But like, wow, <laughs> you know, in the movie Seven, where they don't show you what's in the box. Yeah, when when Brad Pitt goes, "What's in the box?" I didn't see that movie, but I trust you. You know that moment though. Oh, uh, his no. girlfriend gets like his girlfriend gets beheaded, and that's this big moment. Oh, shit. And, and this, he has a box, and he's like, "What's in the box?" And that's more artistic when you don't yeah. see what's in the box. You right, don't right. want to see what's in it. Yeah. Oh, the internet's destroying us. I think I had the we had the option to see the Daniel Perlman beheading at some time, and I was like, mm, I think I never want to see an actual beheading. I think I saw that one, and you saw like part of it, and then it cut to them holding the head. Mm-hmm. Bad. Yeah. Oh man, this is what they like Facebook back when they used to try to moderate this stuff. Facebook, they would talk about these people whose job it was basically to filter the videos. Oh, it and sounded sickening. And they get PTSD. Sickening. Yeah. And mm-hmm. it would be people like – this one article was you know, some general who probably killed 10 people in his own time. But like eventually he started having breakdowns after work. Like he couldn't handle. God dang. But that's what it is. And yeah. once AI starts making realistic things. Well, wouldn't that be a great use of AI is being able to track that? Instead of having humans do it? Sure, or, but I or... think it's but but then what happens, I think I come out on the other end where I had so many early TikToks get uh taken down and I was like, Well, it's my dad's head, I can do what I want. <laughs> but because they said you're bullying and it was a joke at my own expense. And oh. being a comedian trying to like build something on social media, you you also see the other end of uh, blanket censorship, and then you got kids going unalive myself and, and sags, and, and, and you're like, "What are we doing? Grape? What are we doing?" <laughs> yes, I know it's so stupid, it's so infantilizing. But at the same time, then you look at Elon Musk and you go, "the the the f word has gone up in usage ten thousand percent," and you go, yeah. "Well, that's not good either." Right, right, right. And I don't know what the solution is. Yeah, there. Yeah, me neither. I think no heads, though. Yeah, I think that's a baseline. Is every but then what's her name, Kathy uh, Griffin? Griffin is going to go. Well, this is art, <laughs> and I, that's that's she, where it goes. All she, uh, her the, she did not post that. Did you know somebody else posted it? Like she just like she was did it for screwing around with the photographer uh-huh. and held it up, and they made just like a funny picture, was and she a didn't post about? it. Possibly. I mean, you don't have one in your house. Oh, yeah, you're right. You're right. You're right. Uh, Mine is of Hillary. I'd... But um... <laughs> oh, that's right. Oh, uh, <laughs> but yeah. So she did. She wasn't trying to post that. Somebody else did. <laughs> oh man. Um. So. But yeah, my uh, yeah, my son doesn't make too many complaints, you know, and mm-hmm. I try. I try to talk around him and deflect it back to me that's that's what's interesting to me anyway i'm like i'm the star of this show not him you know my life was ruined by his birth not not his you mm-hmm. know so let's make it about me that's that's how i go. were you never married no Mm-mm. you know what's funny though because i i was just googling uh your ex and there was a <laughs> valentine's day flyer and it said real life husband and wife and it listed you two in the flyer promo for this Valentine's Day show. What what club? I don't know. I mean it 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 was it was some but it, it swear to God and I checked yeah. it and I was like, are they saying to other people? and it was it was you two and it was it was billing it as husband and wife. So all the husbands and wives would be like, Let's go. Oh, of course. Let's yeah. go and go, she was right, he was right. <laughs> But it was very funny to to see that as a promo because it was while I was researching and I think I listened to your like WTF and you were like, oh, no, we were not married. Yeah. No, we weren't. No. Um, when you when you split up, did you join custody? I talk about for people um, joining. I'm a big divorce. Yeah. Aficionado. Divorce. Oh. Aficionado. Yeah. <laughs> Multiple divorces in my family. And I love talking about custody. We. Uh, <laughs> it was messy. Sure. You know, um, thankfully, we weren't married. 
Um, uh, but we ended up going to uh, to mediation, mm-hmm. <laughs> and uh, just stuff came up in mediation where the 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 mediator was like, "What?" and um, kind of heavily encouraged him that that I would have custody Monday through Friday, and he would like have every other weekend, and said, "You probably, given what you've just told us, you're probably not going to get." what you want which is full custody you wanted full custody yes yes I, with uh... <laughs> with uh somebody he was had just met uh-huh and um so i'm like who's like i was introduced to this person the concept of this person in the meeting i'm like the concept yes. of this person i'm like so who's this woman that wants to raise my son uh-huh. that you just met and i've never heard of and the mediator's like what is this conversation like yeah and so the fact that that was so sloppily done sure was pretty much her saying it's that what you're asking for would never happen. So mediator, this is this is so this is not a legal. Is it a lawyer trained? This is just to try to come to agreement without going to court. Right, right. And you're both splitting the bill for the mediator. I think the mediator was free. I think it was like a really? city service. Yeah. Oh. Uh, it was very cheap. I I did have a lawyer, uh, but you know he did very little. Um, and it we went in with her, and then I guess he wrote something afterwards or something something like that that codified it that's fascinating my my dad at least with my little sister like i i my whole life has been like i learned his version of things and then later gradually learned other versions right and then all you know i question the other versions too i think it's all skewed i know i tell my son i mean that's what i you know i try not to comment on things and it's like he's gonna come up he's gonna see both sides and then his Mm -hmm. own side and but when you were dating this guy i was headlining um uh the river center comedy club and he was my feature oh my god todd berry saw the whole thing went because he was working another club yeah Mm -hmm. it was thanksgiving weekend you fucked your opener (laughs) my feature he was not the (laughs) mc that needs to be stated clearly (laughs) wait that's that's the code that's the degree yes Okay. I don't I don't fuck someone who does raffle announcements at the end of the show. All right. Please. Um so you did every other weekend. Something like that, yeah. Mm-hmm. Cuz you know, I thought the other day so my my to get really nitty-gritty, it was a two-week cycle. If we're starting on a Monday, it would be at my mom's Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, dad's Thursday, Friday. Mom, Saturday, Sunday, Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, dad's Friday, Saturday, Sunday. And I look back and I go, my mom never had a Friday, Saturday, Sunday together. And I go, that prevents trips. It prevents it prevents the full experience of a weekend. Right. And I feel like my mom, she got more real estate. But while I was at school. Yeah, my dad got the f- more fun days, and it also fucked up my weekend because I would go from my dad's on Friday to my mom's on Saturday every other weekend. So my my fun time was broken up with this split. Yeah, and I think that also made me like, oh, if I do a sleepover Friday night, then I lose that time with. So my they dad. weren't flexible uh, with uh, no switching I, it out. I think I could have like dem- I I. I it's hard to. It's you didn't hard to know reflect. what you could demand. Yeah, I didn't know what I could demand, and I also think, like looking back, my dad was just. I was antisocial, and my dad is hyper antisocial, and so I look back and I go, "Wow, I shouldn't have spent so many Fridays watching Seinfeld with my dad. I should have been doing sleepovers." And I don't think he guilted me or made me feel bad, but it was like it was my dad. I felt like I didn't see him that much. Yeah, we were very close. We were hyper, hyper dependent until my little sister came along and like I think they became hyper dependent. And oh. I was the I I then saw like why this was a problem. Right. But it, but I look back at that custody agreement. I'm like that weekend split was not smart. No, not at all. And so were you like I, I always wonder like how my son sees everything, you know, mm-hmm. and I'll I guess I'll find out. You know, because he's still in the middle of it. Yeah. Um. 
So How old was he when you split? Three. So he doesn't. Three. Yeah. I was he like at the mediation? Like no, as, uh, no, no, no. Uh-uh. Okay. It was just the two of us. Yeah. Sure. Uh, but uh, yeah. I I I mean I hope. You know I hope we're doing. I hope he's okay. I feel like he's okay. You know. But you, you, you just don't know what people, people with with married parents are fucked up. I mean, like yes. everyone, everyone could be fucked up. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, I don't know, man. It's it just both my my dad spoke ill of my mom and and vice versa. But my dad, my mom did her best. I look back, I look back now at this age, and I do see my mom as like doing her best but she married a guy who was like super strict and he was he he my stepfather right like, he was difficult and she i don't know i, I my mom that, and i are close are much closer are so much closer now yeah i never wanted a stepfather to butt in you know did like, you have any did, did you have any i had a couple guy? relationships and um you know at, at the at the end of the, you know, it, they were always like the third thing, you know, number one was my kid. Number two was comedy. Mm-hmm. And well, I guess they were the four things. Three is, is my job at Conan. Right. Sure. And then four is whatever I've left, which would be any a night I'm not booked that my son's already, you know, goes to bed early at. So I really had nothing to give anyway. Sure. But I didn't want I just didn't want anyone else's. I didn't want anyone else in there. And in fact, and somebody I couldn't verify, like somebody who could be, who could end up being, you know, go wild. And then I'd have to kick them out. And I, sure. d- I didn't want that drama a- at all in my life, especially for my kid. See, what's funny is it's because with my dad, my dad was the dater. And yeah. he he was the drama. <laughs> right, right, you right. You know, there was so many, this is again, learning as I got older. It was like, oh, that woman left because he cheated not because she had a She's traumatic a childhood and is a <laughs> oh. little crazy. He never said bitch, yeah. but he, he would go, oh, she had a lot of trauma when she was younger and she's not crazy, but intimating they right. had kind of gone off the deep end. Right. I listened as much as I could, son. Yeah. Yeah. And that's, for me, that's what I look at as the most, I think, traumatic or like bad thing of my childhood it was like women I was close with and then vanished from my life. Yeah. And not having any kind of relationship. And I don't think, you know, I know some of them now. I know my my half sisters. She was my former stepmom. And like, we don't have a relationship. She's yeah. sweet. She's yeah. kind. But it feels awkward to me. Yeah, right, it's right, right. It's a weird right. feeling. Yeah. And that sucks. And now they'll some they'll see a comedy show. There's a rare thing being a comedian is I like yeah. create an avenue where they can right. see me. Right, right, right. And I can go, thank you. But they're an audience member. Yeah. You know, so it's Yeah. That was the tough part. Yeah, I bet. I I uh Yeah, I had a very different upbringing than my son has, you know? They stayed together to the end? My parents, yeah. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Uh so uh yeah, I um even the comedy thing isn't the weird part to me. It's the it's the one parent or the other parent hardly ever together, you know? Yeah, yeah, yeah. And uh so you he, you know, I guess he you would know this more than I. He has two selves. He has mm-hmm. he's two children. He's the child to the mother and the child to the father. And um my mom the, the most toxic thing my mom said was some like whenever she picked me up at my dad she'd be like you she, she intimated like I I had was a different person at my dad's or I had like started dressing like my dad in yeah. a way where she was like calling out what probably was true. Yeah. You know, I come from my dad suddenly I'm wearing uh, wife beater, as we would call it, and like shorts, <laughs> right. and yeah, and I'm sure for her she was like, "Oh my god, I I'm picking up this this creature that's changed." But yeah, for right, me, it was right. Like, it's me. I'm me. Yeah, yeah, and yeah. For her, it was like, "You're just you're you're trying out selves, you know. You're trying out attitudes and ways to be and stuff." Did you ever try like family nights? Like, oh, we'll all have dinner together. We have done that. You know, it they they come and go. Yeah. There's a lack of consistency that's really frustrating to me. They tried, I mean, truly, when I was a kid, they tried a, once a month or something. They bring a present. My dad, I think my dad was really big, like Pavlovian, will bring a present. He'll associate this with good things. Yeah. 
And it was like number three. They got in a fight and they left before the appetizers arrived. And I remember the appetizers coming out as my <sighs> dad left or something like that. Right. Um, That's the thing. Like, ideally, you would be able to provide, like, to to say, this is what it would be like if we got along. Mm-hmm. <laughs> and you could have had this life, you know, had we gotten along. You don't. And I hope you can create it anyway. <laughs> you know, like I, I hope my, I hope my kid can have a really happy family life and not yeah. be have something that's split between two households. Um, this is the horror I think of. I know so much. This is why, like, having a kid would be so. Because I know well enough that even if I went into a divorce or a split custody with the best intentions, I've seen so intimately how the kid makes it impossible and makes the problems intractable and ultimately these two people unable yeah. to like 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 countries that will never get along right and and there seems to be no solution and i see now with my friends some of them are starting to get divorced finally right <laughs> and and when they talk about it i'm like i'm seeing this and you're talking about your ex like they're evil yeah and 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 i get it and I also know how they probably think you're evil and there's no – the kid is only going to suffer. I know. It's tough. It is hard. And also that person might be evil just to you because of who you are and be perfectly perfectly pleasant to everybody else. Uh-huh. So let's talk something about even more traumatic writing for late night television. <laughs> I, uh, What's late night? Is is it? Does it still exist? No, not re- once you left Conan, it was over. <laughs> uh, no, we had we had Ian Carmel on, and he, oh, he cool. kind of shared his thoughts about the the end of late night. I am. What did what what did he say? Oh, he he was very trying to be polite to not be like, well, now that I left, it's over. But yeah, but said it's it's looking rough. I as. I love jokes. Mm-hmm. I love monologue jokes, good monologue jokes. I still think <sighs> Weekend Update, like, I think they do. I think it's one of the few shows that I'm like, some of these jokes are really good jokes. Yeah. Really good one-liners. Yeah. And I enjoy watching it and hearing the audience go, oh, my God. <laughs> and yeah. they really, they push it. Yeah. They push it in a way that even other aspects of the show I don't think push, but I think they have yeah. kept that yeah, yeah. sharp. Yeah. Um. You've written for uh, Craig Ferguson. A little bit, yeah. Conan. Yeah. Conan would be like the one. Conan's the one. And how many years did you write Eleven. Model Tricks for that? Eleven, Eleven. years, yeah. Um and did you did you do that because did you start writing because you if you could have just been a stand up comedian and just done road stuff, would you have just done that? Or did you like being in that writer's room. Did you like the monologue? Oh, I loved hustle? I loved being in the writer's room. Yeah. I loved I love writing jokes. I loved it. Um when I you know when I moved to New York, uh I w- before that I was just living with my parents and mm-hmm. doing road gigs and it was so fun. Yeah. And then I'm like I got to do something. So I moved to New York and then I had a day job from then on. Yeah. So when I was doing I, I was doing like HTML coding and kind of like early internet stuff. Yeah. Um, and then I switched over, then I got a writing job, a tough crowd. So mm-hmm. I just kept the same hours. So it, it, it wasn't like I was ever a touring only headliner. Uh, when I got to New York, you almost had to drop everything and not go on the road at all and just focus on getting like, oh, start over. Like now I'm going to be a 15 minute New York city club comic. Sure. And I went, and so I just focused all my energy on that kind of left road work, except for a few clubs behind, um, and then, you know, I started when when I started writing on, I guess more on Conan. Um, I started using hiatus weeks to like you know do headlining work and stuff. I always did comedy um, throughout the whole all of the time I had a writing job. Right now is like the first time I'm like free form out there. Mm-hmm. Fucking hate it. <laughs> really? But it's so different now too. You have to do so much self promotion. That's know it. not fun, you know. But you're great at it. Um, yeah, I think. But it is. It is the work. I think I've been trying to reframe it. I mean, listen, it's it's so much work. It is. It's so much work. And now it's like I have, I have many people on like a team and i think i've tried to 
reframe it for myself as, oh, this is my TV show. My what what I what I put together, whether it be promo. I like. Can I do promo that feels like, oh, this is a cool advertisement. Yeah. If I'm right. gonna make a flyer, let's let's come up with a funny idea to make it feel more creative. Yeah. Right. 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 But it's it's a slog. It is a slog. And if you I think if, like this these two months I I hired a publicist and someone mm-hmm. to help me with the web stuff. Um and that's been a great relief. You know, just to have she like the LA Times did a Julie Seabod did a big article I on saw. me yesterday and I was like, "Oh, I got to make a <laughs> I got to make a graphic out of it." So like that's when I, and then Melanie did it for me and I was like, "Ah, I just posted. Sure. This is not bad. Sure. If you could have someone go, oh, here, it's all done. Here's the hashtags. Sure. Oh, okay. Um, I'd love to be able to do that, you know, get to that point uh, where I, I just do 10% of it. But now I'm like opening up iMovie, uh, it crashes, you know, all yeah, this stuff yeah, where yeah, I'm yeah. like, why a 30 second video would take four hours and then 15 people watch it. You know? Of course. Uh, but I think, <sighs> the, I think what I see sometimes with, with older comedians is Mm -hmm. is they sometimes they get these social media people this is so niche but they they and they don't do they're not doing a good enough job Mm -hmm. you i would love and i don't i never will i would love to get kind of comics that i admire and go you this is what you need to be doing i see some especially some comics with a wealth of 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 footage that exists. Yes. Right, right, you right. You know, I could take, you know, I'm like, give me everything from your last comic standing and I'll show you 40 clips right. in there. Right, that right. That you right. can gradually post yeah. on Snapchat, on YouTube shorts, on TikTok, yeah. on on Reddit. And like you have a wealth of footage ripe for exploitation, but Hiring an overall social media manager that isn't top tier, they're not going to do it well, and it's going to be posted poorly, and the cuts are going to be bad, and the captions will be misspelled, or they won't be timed out right, yeah. and there'll be three hashtags on tweets. I see people with hashtags on their tweets, oh my God. and I yeah. want to scream. Right, right, right. And I go, I know you're paying someone $500 to do this, <laughs> and they're just copy-pasting this on every single platform, and they're not – every platform's its own beast. I know. That's the other thing, too. I mean, there's. It's just so overwhelming, you but, know. But you have the footage. You have the part that is the yeah, art. That's true. I have a ton of jokes that I could yeah. be clipping out. Yes, and mm-hmm. and maybe you know I'll get this special all clipped out into the sixty As clips that it is, mm-hmm. and then maybe I'll have enough uh, money from extra road work that I could hire someone to you know go through other stuff. And the socials they pay. That YouTube pays. This is very business talk. I apologize. It does listening. pay? Not this lady. But well, I mean, when you, you have, break through. When you break YouTube, through. The YouTube, the YouTube pays. We'll talk after. But Okay. I, writing monologue jokes. I've never written. I don't know if I. I think I'd be frustrating writing for someone else. I think I'd just be jealous. I'd go, I, sh- I want this. <laughs> Did you ever get to. So, so you would. For Conan, for example. How many jokes would you write for each day? I would, would you have a, say, you know, between. 25 to 40 you know maybe closer to 40 but it, it it would also depend on the news stories sometimes the news stories are so great you're like they're falling out of you the yeah, jokes yeah, yeah. you know and other days you know there's a mass shooting <laughs> you're uh-huh. like and then it's like then so you, many they <laughs> can- cancel the guests we have an all mono hour <laughs> Then you're like uh, googling penis to see if there's any penis studies. You know uh-huh, what I mean? Uh-huh. When you that's there's some bottom of the barrel days. For Conan, would they give you uh, headlines to work with, or would they just be like, "No, you we, let us know." We um we had writers assistants uh, and interns that would find headlines, but we also did it, the writers we did it ourselves. Um, and that that actually ended up being really valuable because I think you, it's basically that's the setup is the headline, right? Sure. But you need to rewrite it so it's a joke setup. So sometimes like the interns and they're like really young, so mm-hmm. they're, they they're just doing what they're told. They would just grab the headlines and then you know you'd be like, okay, I'll I'll reshape this into a setup and then then do the punchline later. But uh, uh, yeah, we would write our own setups too, premises. Were you? 
did you get ever frustrated about the limitations of what you were allowed to joke about for Conan, at least when it was in the later slot? Like, was it, did you ever feel stifled? More, it was more, um, the stifling would be just by what the news stories were, Mm -hmm. Uh, especially after Trump became a prominent feature of a lot of stories. It's, you know, he he was just exhausting. And oh, Obama was hard, too, though. You kind of had to make fun of the coverage of Obama and not hi- Obama himself unless he really went off the rails, which he never did. You know, did that feel frustrating? Did it? I mean, I I certainly feel like I, I uh, grew up watching the heyday of liberal fawning i look back at a lot of a lot of the the especially with trump being around and i go like we a lot of comedy it's it's really toothless and there's a lot of just respect for just the people who happen to be in power in the democratic party and we're not you know it's pr or it's it's just it's so exhausting with with the trump stuff i don't know i look back at it all and i i go oh it was really pandery and we weren't critical enough no, I mean, you know, different like Mitt Romney was always fun because he was just so rich and dingy and good looking mm-hmm. and um, not connected. And that's sure. the perfect person to make like he had horse dancing horses in the Olympics. Like, sure. And then it was weird. You know, I had an old Facebook page that I just got a hold of. Like yeah. I just was able to log into it. And I would would put all my old – this is like in 2010, 11, 12. Yeah. A lot of jokes up there, you know, because this is kind of pre-Twitter, really. Sure. And um, and so many <laughs> Chris Christie – and I think you know where we go with Chris Christie uh-huh. jokes. It's not a place we go now. <laughs> Though sometimes, unless he says unless he says enough of a bad thing, then right. it opens up the floodgates. It does, but yeah. So th- I was like, oh, this is such a snapshot of what was acceptable back then. Um yeah, so it you know different different people are fun to make fun of, and some are just misery. You know, you have to you have to move around so many different. I think I had you know, some joke obstacles. about Chris Christie, and all it opened with was, so Chris Christie was on CNN, so they had to pull the camera back, and that's <laughs> that's how it started, and it, and then it went to another thing, but it always got a laugh, <laughs> and uh, we <laughs> but we struggle we struggle with with like. Body positivity I until know. we disagree with them, and then we say all the things that we were absolutely thinking already. My feeling is, if if they're an awful person, go, no holds barred, go for everything, and don't and don't take it personally if they're describing you're not an awful person. So, but mm-hmm. I can see how people are. It yeah, doesn't work whatever. to what I found fascinating because yeah. I have this podcast. Is you know I'll have uh, uh, women guests on, yeah, and I get a quick window into the uh, horrifying nature of the comments women get online. Oh, and I right, see it because right. they're on my video right, talking right, right. about her, and I go like, Jesus Christ, <laughs> shut! I mean, like crazy. Right. And also, not even there's the vicious ones, and then there's ones of like people saying, someone wrote, let's just say years ago, and they wrote like. Wow, you 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 have a lot of guests of size on the podcast. And I'm like, what are you doing? Oh what are God. you saying? Why are you why are you saying this thing? How could you think that this is worth sharing? And and I don't. Oh, that's great. I yeah, remember, I, I think didn't Mark Maron say he had to turn off his the comments because the oh, comments were so bad to the female guests. Yeah, but my father, my dad. He's one of those guys. Again, I luckily I can talk about my father. He doesn't listen to this podcast, but like he is one of those people who like he'll just he'll he can't seem to not make a comment right. about like a, a woman's weight, and it's often when he's like dealing with his own, yeah, like, worried about his own weight. And he said stuff to me about my weight here and there, yeah. Um, but and, why, why do you fluctuate or? Yeah, I okay. used to not not anymore. Yeah. Um. Now that I'm in LA, but <laughs> I I. Yeah, there was one. There was one time he saw me for a birthday. He was, it was my birthday, and I had a cheesesteak to celebrate my birthday. And he was yeah. like, "So, put on a couple pounds," and I snapped. I snapped. <laughs> I, I mean, I mean the bad. I said, "I'm gonna lie down in the road <laughs> and let a car kill." <laughs> but we would be watching. Um, so you think you can dance? And one of the judges was was like, you know, just a, a, a compared to the dancers was larger. 
Yeah. And was also, but she was also the woman who was loud on the panel. That was her role on the panel. And my dad would just make comments. And my sister, who, uh, you know, thankfully is already anorexic, so it's fine. (laughs) But she she has happened to, my sister's just genetically blessed and eats garbage and is thin. Yeah. So, but he'd say these things and I'd be like, what are you doing? And he just, it was like, in his gut, he just said it. It's yeah. just part of his nature. Yeah. You couldn't lecture it out of him. I don't know why guys do this, why guys feel that need. I, I do know. I think it's ultimately deep down, they worry that if they make it acceptable, then more women will not be uh, to their desire and will ultimately they'll lose control. It's all about the ultimate. I feel so cut off from all that now, you know, because uh-huh. I guess because I'm old and so I don't, I'm not really trying to even get a guy or sure. get that guy especially of course i'm i'm excited for um like the next phase where i'm alone yeah you know I, 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 like i want to move to europe like i'm i'm i have you want to move to europe yeah i want to do i don't know like um i, have, I said a tour there was the, the com- exactly uh, there's so many there's so much you can I, like i gotta pick a city t- that's kind of cheap that i can you know get to a lot of places from i don't know where i don't speak any languages but i you have, don't speak spanish uh, yeah but i mean I, I i'm sure i could you know resuscitate it in myself but it you know it, high school to go to spanish. london to start your spanish <laughs> yeah so so i guess i i'm not i i don't really you know take those comments to heart i guess really about appearance i'm like i i'm just glad i'm alive i know enough comics my age or from my age group that died mm-hmm. you know and so i'm i'm glad i'm here and i st- feel like i'm still funny so you know come i don't care what you say although somebody did do you ever watch do you watch attack on titan no i don't think oh so. it's this anime and yeah. well if you guys i grew up in anime like I was Adjacent? more Dragon Ball Z yeah. when I was younger. Okay. So somebody, because I have kind of a gummy smile, and somebody called me a Titan. And I was like, <laughs> <laughs> I can't really come back from that. Well, now the comments are all going to have gummy, oh, they are. gummy smile. That's okay. I'll take it. Do you, your son's 17 now? Yeah. Mm-hmm. Like, when you have a kid, I feel like you must fantasize about what's coming up, this moment of... Like, do you have, do you, do you think it'll live up to it? Do you think you'll feel lonely? Do you think? I have no idea. Like when he, he went away for Christmas and I was wildly lonely mm. and I was so looking forward to being alone. Yeah. And then he was gone and I just was waiting for him to come home. It's a prob you know, what I, what I think it's going to be like and what it will be like will be so different. I, and also he might go to community college here and not leave home at all. Would you want that? Then you can't go to Europe. I can, oh, sure I can. He'll be go? 18. Yeah. I'll sure, see you later. Sure. Feed the dog. See ya. Yeah. When you go on the road, do you have like an opener you bring frequently? I don't. Um really? No, I sort of just do, I just show up and you really? know, work with whoever's local. Do I, you? More recently, I've, I've this guy, Liam Nelson and his friend, uh, uh, Ty uh, Colgate. And um, it's been nice. We, we like, we've found a little bit more of a vibe of, cause I need it. I've, it was, I was just feeling lonely. Yeah. Deeply. Just like Sun is on long plane rides. Just like, I'm really sad. Oh, uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. I've been doing, I mean, I've just also been going hard on the road. Yeah. In a way that is, I need something. I need, I, I'm just a lonely, I'm an introvert. And I like, if I don't have someone to go out with, I struggle to go out. And I right. just, I go, oh, I'll be in the hotel and I'll just write all fucking day. And then by 4 p.m. I'm like, I think I'm going crazy. I think I'm losing my mind. <laughs> I, um... I mean, I would, I'd love to, again, I need to be making more money, but I'd love to be able to bring an opener because they, they get paid so little. You have to supplement. Do mm-hmm. you, you must, right? Or. Oh yeah. 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 More, yeah. Now I'm finally, I finally have door deals now. And that's great. We're rapidly, it's rapidly moving towards, okay, now I can, like, I think this weekend is like, I said, oh, now that we're selling out, I, I'll figure out the plane ticket and, oh, and we'll build and build and figure, you know, that's awesome. Then you, then I look at uh, the Maria Bamford's of the world and I, I believe Jackie Cation says she gives one third and I go, yeah. Oh boy. One third, <laughs> one third. <laughs> yeah. But that's the only way to have uh, uh, basically a headliner yeah. open for you yeah. is one third. Yeah. I hear 10%. And I go, that's still pretty high too. I'm yeah. 
But I want to be, you know, you you look and you go, oh, I want to be a giving. I'd love, I'd love opener. to be able to do that. Yeah. Now, I, I, my, I wouldn't even require. You know, I have a tendency to hook up with my future, so I wouldn't even want to see them. It's very, it's a danger zone. <laughs> yeah. Um. Yeah. I would. I would like that one day, but I don't. I don't have that right now. Sure. And I do when I go on the road, yeah, because I'm. I, I love the alone time. I love being in my hotel room. I bring a robe. I bring a heating pad. I bring a lot of stuff to make it feel like a little vacation. You know? Yeah. Um, one thing that you, you mentioned when we talked about things that you were tired of talking about, and I wonder if this is a more unique way of looking at it, was about people go, how do you write jokes about trauma? Which I don't... <laughs> right, right. Which was, you know, that's what I do. I don't need to, I don't yeah. need to ask that. Do you ever worry, uh, because, you know, famously, um, as your mom was was, uh, ultimately passed away from COVID, you Mm -hmm. were really sharing that experience on on Twitter. Mm -hmm. And I'm someone certainly, my dad had a a quintuple bypass. And, you know, I know as it's happening, the the experience was very unique. My, my... uh, for example, we got there. My dad, whose will is not, I'm not dependent on my father's will, thankfully. Yeah. Like I'm, I, that's not a concern of mine. Yeah. If he said there's no money, it's that's okay. Yeah. Um, but it was, we got there and my girlfriend who had never met my father, I, my dad was adjusting his will to leave a third to his new girlfriend who is now his ex-girlfriend. <laughs> oh, no. Who, oh, who no. has, who had like, comically large tits <laughs> like comically oh large tits your dad and and so my girlfriend was f- had to film <laughs> on my dad's phone on my phone my dad like reading his will cuz like to next to me and my girlfriend and we're all in our covid masks and it was just just a as it's happening i know <laughs> as a comic i'm like i will be talking about this <laughs> That is and, insane. And how old is your dad that he still makes these sort of decisions? 69. That is bananas. Yeah. Yeah. And he's my dad. He was a, a gorgeous guy. Yeah. And and I think the kind of good looking that I think um, allows you to not challenge your right. character. Yes. And like, let me tell you, my dad's my dad's childhood was fucked up. Right. In a way that I can't fathom. I had depressed parents. I The way I described it once when I tried writing a play was I, uh, my fam, my parents, they had the, who's afraid of Edward Albee, like uh, who's afraid of uh, Virginia Woolf, yeah, Edward right, Albee right. level fucked up parents. Yeah. And I had the survivors of that as my parents. Right. So they were depressed and they were fucked up. And so I wasn't abused. I wasn't hit, right. but I had the fucked up parents who were. And so it's a different kind of, of trauma of sorts but right. so so i you know i feel sympathy in the sense that like the horrors my dad experienced as a kid are unimaginable right right um but yes he's still like that and and these these but okay so as do as, you hope he changes i'm far beyond hoping see what my mom lived with me and she was very she was depressed and mm. i kept hoping she would change i realized this after she died like i was trying to like she was cut, her colors were black and navy blue. Like that was the her that was what she emanated, uh-huh. you know. And I was trying to get some yellow in there, uh-huh. <laughs> and I didn't I didn't realize it till after she was gone. And I'm like, well, I I what was I doing? <laughs> that wasn't her at all. Sure. And so I was always unsatisfied with her because she was just like such a downer and always saw the negative side. And it's like, yeah, for 83 years, did I think I was going to like flip the pancake and she would be a different person. Part of me was hoping for that, I guess. It's a, my father, it feels like he's not, and he runs a company, so it's not like he's like not there, but it feels like he's not there yeah. when it comes to personal growth. Mm. Do you have siblings? Yeah, I have a sister. But your mom lived with you right. for the last four years of her life? Correct. Let me tell you, I hear that. I I could yeah. not live with my father. It was really hard. Was that, was it assumed you were the sister to take that burden? I think so. I had a, I mean, I needed some help. I needed to be able to go do spots at night without paying a sitter, you know, mm. 
I needed someone to watch my son help out, and my mom wanted to. Did and you tell your mom, like, don't, no Republican talking points with my kid? <laughs> she was actually not bad about that. Like, we didn't have Fox News, and she listened to the radio in her room, but um, she, yeah, she didn't really talk to my son about that kind of stuff. You and joke he was about too young it in your to... special. Would she have turned down the vaccine? I don't think so. Uh huh. I, I think she would have been okay with it. That's yeah. Good. But, you know, she's not here to dispute it. And... Sure. <laughs> but maybe not. She wouldn't have gotten the second booster. <laughs> <laughs> uh no i honestly when i when i heard when i hear and i knew about it before i saw the special and i just go like it, it would never i mean it, it couldn't my father i would be that youtube video if holding he, his head if, and they go was he a government <laughs> official no he was just difficult if you had a kid and no uh a very uh a girlfriend not that the mother wasn't that involved mm-hmm. and you your dad offered to watch your child every night so you could do stand I'd have to witness it. I, I feel like my dad, for all his flaws, was a very loving father mm-hmm. and very, like, I, I think he would be able to connect to that. Yeah, he'd be a good grandpa. But he'd also, I'd also be like, what did you, what did you feed my kid? Like, you let my kid, <laughs> like, he, like, spoiled the shit out of me. I, to me, that was never, I, it never, thought about any of that stuff it was it's more the day-to-day living with a parent at, when you're a grown-up that's really really hard that i really needed the help so but also i think it's nice that i have no connection with really my my uh what do you call them extended family mm-hmm. and like i think there's a there's a loneliness to that like yeah. i had grandparents i knew them but like they weren't a part of my life yeah and in a way i think that makes you feel more connected to community yeah. oh yeah my son you know had her for four years when he was young so he has de- deep deep memories of her you know mm-hmm. and always will yeah the fact that you that you make so much comedy i mean specifically about both your dead parents you have literally a whole special about your dad dying mm-hmm. do you ever feel like turning it into comedy or turning it into art or turning it into content, depending on how you know you're feeling, that it's a void. The artist in me goes, "This is me processing it. This is me. Mm-hmm. This is me expressing myself." The cynic in me goes, "This is me exploiting it. This is me not fully feeling it. This is me turning it into a setup that I then have to solve for the punchline, as opposed to feeling sad." I I. I felt both of them. Mm-hmm. I felt, I mean, I felt my dad die completely. And mm-hmm. then I kind of was like so shocked by that response, you know, in addition to being shocked at him being dead and uh, w- with all of it, yeah. that that led to a ton of jokes just because I was like, before this, I was just a dumb comic. And now I'm like, I'm in this weird, this crazy world where my dad died and I'm wailing and I can't, you know, like you, you do float above and watch and go, who is this person? I'm I'm in a horror movie now, Mm -hmm. you know? So, and with my mom, it was different feelings, but I, they were all there. Yeah. So I don't, I don't feel the difference between noticing and exploiting, you know? Was there any thought, there's a dark thought that I think is like, so I right now have this chunk about my dad's, uh, heart uh this whole surgery yeah and it's it's uh i'm proud of it it's, yeah. it's, a, it's a good chunk it's dark and twisty i know that there's sometimes i have a thought the dark thought of oh i need to film this if my dad died if my dad died i'd be lying if i said there wasn't the passing thought of like fuck do i pretend he's still alive so i can do this chunk do I? You wouldn't like be able my, to. I know. I know that. No, you should film it. No, no, yeah, yeah. I, you know, I plan to. But it's such. But like that's what I mean. Like with the tying of. And I, I think I expressed it to my girlfriend, and she couldn't help but put it also in the context of our relationship. Like, do I ever think about not breaking up because I talk a great deal about her and our relationship and. And that's the art that I make. That's just what I do. It's not a choice. It just that's literally where the funny thoughts are. That I talk so much about these people in my life, 
and in a way that means that my relationship to them is tied to I don't know. She, no, she just expressed the feeling of I understand. like, would you ever not break up with me so you could do the night terrors bit on film? No, their absence is just as strong a presence in your life as their presence. Mm-hmm. So when if you did break up your, with your girlfriend, that would be as much a part of you as having her. Yeah. And, you know, in who you are as a person processing it and a comic. Same with your parents. It's yeah. it's. But yeah, in terms of like, I, you know, when I. I did a, like a JFL gala and my mom was 82 and living with me and I had a bunch of jokes about how I wanted her to die, uh-huh. you know, and um, and the, you could only tell those like I can only have the the exhaustion in my voice because they're real and they're true. Yeah. And uh, I would not have been able to tell them after she died. My voice would have changed. Sure. You know what I mean? Like yeah. you, can, you can't even fake it. Yeah. So, yeah, do, you know, if you feel the chunks done about your dad, get it on tape. Sure. And then, you know, if he keeps living, you'll have new stuff about him. <laughs> and when he's not, no longer, you'll have a whole new vista to Yeah, I think I think my girlfriend, she, she, under, she gets art. But I think the way she took it in a way that where it was as if I was inhuman. And I tried, <laughs> I, you know, for a moment, because I yeah. can see how from an outside perspective, it sounds like you're worried about losing your chunk. And it was, <laughs> it was more like, I expressed it more like, no, this is what the trauma, this is, this is what I get from the trauma of this challenging childhood is this art. And that's, it's not just like a, a, a money or it's, 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 I don't know. It, you have to understand what art is. You have to understand what art is to the artist. Right. It's not just a, a piece of furniture or, or something I should inherit or I deserve. It's more like this is my. Well, I would. I know. But when that person that you're talking about is no longer in your life mm-hmm. for whatever reason, you your opinion of that material changes. Sure. too. Sure. And now you're you are an explorer. So you're like, what's new? You're always what's new. Yeah. And what's new is heartbreak. What's new is grief. What will be new? One day, especially grief. I don't yeah. know about heartbreak. And I that think, will be what you will be, uh, you know, crawling towards. Sometimes I just think I'm like, you know what, stand-up comedy, or, uh, what would the world be if we had never invented filming? <laughs> right? You know, like, like right. it, it would just be of the moment and you yeah. had to be there. I think there was something when they started, like, re- making audio recordings. Like, there were some people who were, like, the same way people do with AI now. Yeah. Where it's like, this is bad. We yeah, shouldn't right, do this. Right, right. And imagine if if we never had recorded. Same with photographs. Sure. Yeah. And they might not be wrong. <laughs> um, uh, our last uh, uh, two things. So this has got to stop. Did, did we put this in the email? Something that's got to stop. Something mm. that you're tired of, exhausted with. Uh, let me see. I think I wrote down one that it, it can be personal. It can be big. Mm-hmm. Um, let me just see if I put one here. This has got to stop. Okay. So I kind of touched on this. But I, I, this has got to stop. People who go, I need to do this thing because what would my grandkids think of me if I didn't? They have to frame it in this way where, let me be frank, I wouldn't give a shit what my grandparents did right. in any situation. I think if I found out my grandma had been a Nazi, I'd go, right. whoa, that's not good. <laughs> but it's still my grandma. And yeah. like... I don't – sometimes people have to, like, frame their moral decisions yeah. in a way. This to, – to to frame it, what my grandkids think is almost the atheists, what am I going to say to God at heaven's gate? Right, right, right. It's like you have to create this metaphor. And just like the God one, your grandkids caring about what you did is equally fantastical and not going to happen, in my opinion. Right, right, right. But it's a so my this guy's stuff is just this like what are my grand your grandkids aren't are barely going to give a shit about you yeah let alone what you decided in this one yeah. incident do it for yourself yes yeah I mean if you're relate like you you if you're not adopted like if you're genetically connected you'll be looking at them for like facial features yeah but yeah, that's yeah. about it uh huh yeah I, I yours reminded me of something I can't stand is when people go history will not be kind to a person mm. the. No, history's not kind to anybody. Sure. And these people that are acting this way don't give a shit. Uh-huh. They don't care. Uh-huh. They know it won't matter. 
History will not so history will not be kind to Chevron executives. Do you think they care about yeah. history? Yeah. They don't. Stop it. I see that so much. Like that's the ultimate condemnation. Yeah. <laughs> or just in two hundred years they'll write bad things about I, I barely We need to deal with them now. Yeah, and how many enemies and how many vile villains have lived in the past two hundred years? We don't we don't even know their names. Like you'd have to go down a Wikipedia hole to even sure. read the unkind words that that history says about them. Yeah. You have to be a, a massive demon to be remembered as a bad person, even 50 years later. And again, it's, I think it's just a degree of like, no, if you want to do something, you got to confront them now yes. while they're alive. Yes. Yeah. Unfortunately. Right. But this idea of like Trump's legacy will be whatever. It's like, he's, he's <laughs> doing what he's doing. It's right now. Yeah. I'm sure it's only probably a couple years left. Yeah. And he's enjoying his dinners. Yeah. So if you want to, you got to. Yeah. Do know. it now. I don't know. Kathy Griffin. So, <laughs> uh, and then our final segment, we, we say a blessing. Something we're something specifically we're grateful for, and I'll I'll start with uh, my mom's uh, boyfriend right now. Mm -hmm. A great guy. He's uh, he's so good. Um, His name's Dan. He's so good at. I feel like when I visit, I see my mom or my sisters are there. He's fine with like being like, oh, they're having their family moment. I'm Mm -hmm. just here. They're talking as a family. He just he just socially seems to navigate. The ability to be like, let them have their family moment, and I'm just here, and I'm quiet, or I'll go work, and then he's apart. He's just, he's just very, really a kind of, my mom. She She made a good choice. She made a good choice. And I think there there was one time my mom, she was like, I I think some guy where she was like, I think I'm going to marry this guy. And I was like, not until I meet him, you're not. (laughs) And she was like, I don't have to introduce him. I was like. Actually, no, I I would like the same way that a, a parent gives a blessing for a wedding. It's not necessarily like I'm going to go, don't you dare marry that man. But I'm going to now see this guy every time I see you. Yes. So I'm going to meet him before yeah. you get married. And it was like a moment of like, you listen to me, old lady. <laughs> I I'm a part of this. I wouldn't want to marry somebody my son didn't like. Of course. And I That's think it's a just red flag in her mind. It was like, you know, she's dealing with her own shit. And, and, yeah. but I'm like, no, the same way that you would want to meet someone I was going to get married, I would like to meet this person too. And again, I don't know if they're going to do this, but he's great. And it is, it is a very, it is, I, it is great to visit my mom and go, this guy being here is, doesn't make me uncomfortable. So that's very really grateful. awesome. Yeah. Let's see. I'm, I, that, I'm grateful. My son has a situation with a like a teacher coach authority, right? Mm-hmm. And he came up with a plan on how to do it. And then we did like, I said, well, what if he says this? And he said, I'll say this. And what if he says this? And I'll say this. And I'm like, that is solid. And I've been worrying about it for months. And I'm uh-huh. like, should I interfere? Should, you know, should I? I don't know. Should the mother interfere in this? Or is this something I let him do? And if he does it wrong, well, listen, you know, like uh, all yeah. the possible things that could affect him. And in the meantime, he came up with a pretty simple plan. And if the person, you know, says, well, sorry, you can't do it then. He's ready to walk and uh-huh. he's okay with it. And I was like, wow, that's really cool. Sure. I was sure. so proud that he did that. And he told me and he was excited. And um, and it it was a relief to go, oh, he, you know, he, he can handle this sort of conflict. Uh-huh. And before he couldn't, he was like really afraid, you know, worried about talking to this authoritarian figure. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And he he seems like settled in his in a way that he wasn't before like sure. he was worried and i was and i felt like oh that's that's a jump that's a leap into adulthood i guess yeah that i'm pretty excited about just just being ready to walk ultimately if you're not ready to walk you're not going to get what you want because yes. they got you right they got you and per per the way we started this i think like with with some comedy clubs and with some bookers as i've gotten older i go and i'm in a privileged position now of course and I worked hard for that position to be able to do other things. But it's like, I'm not free unless I'm willing to go, oh, this behavior bothers me. I'm ready to not get that thing. And when you don't, you're not going to get it because they know. They can tell. Yeah. Ready to walk. That could be the title. <laughs> um, so, Lori, tell people this is coming out. 
On, came, out, uh, came out January 30th. No, th- oh, this is this oh, episode's coming out February 13th. Okay. So uh, if you, there's anything you want to plug, but tell people about your special. Okay. Where they can find it. Uh, my special, uh, you can get to it at lauriekilmartin.com. And it'll take you to all possible avenues, mm-hmm. whichever one is your pleasure. And it's about an hour of stand-up. It's that, excellent. Thank you. You like Chia Marco liked it, and he hates everything. So mm-hmm. I paid full price. Full <laughs> price, baby. No, serious. Yeah, where, I love is it. Is there a not full price? I don't way? know. I, I actually I don't know. But mm-hmm. I mean, I thought maybe you got a screener or something like that. I reached out to you. Your publicist didn't reach out to me. This, oh, that's this, right. I set this up. Nice. Thank you. <laughs> I like I, I I like the full price. So pay full price. Um, uh-huh. But no, it's it's you know it's it's my club act, and you know it's weird. I I feel like sometimes people want like a one person show out of a comedy special, mm-hmm. and it's like no, nah, I'm a stand up comic, yeah, and yeah, I work yeah. clubs, and so. You know, that's what it is. But um, I'm pretty dark, and uh, you might like it if you like dark stuff. These Listen, people like me, they like the dark stuff. Yeah. So check it out. And then any tour dates coming up you want to plug? Uh, uh, let's see, February 13th. Um, I will be in uh, – this weekend I'll be at Stir Crazy in Glendale, Arizona. Uh-huh. And then I'll be at Ann Arbor, uh, Ann Arbor Showcase in Mar- March. Also at the uh, Lincoln Lodge in Chicago, March 20th. Um, uh, I have other March dates. Go to LoriKilmartin.com. We'll put it in the show notes. Stir crazy. I, I always get amazed when I hear comedy clubs. I'm like, how did I've never heard about? It happens all the time, and I I'm like, know. I never don't know these. And yeah, uh, I like that name though. Stir crazy. Yeah. Um. Uh. For me, tomorrow is uh, no. What's Valentine's Day? Fourteenth. Fourteenth tonight. Wait a second. Maybe it's coming out two twelve. Same. The same thing. Okay. I'll be in West Nyack, February thirteenth, the day before. No, after. Fuck me, dude. Look at my website. I'm going to be at West Nyack, <laughs> I think, the day before Valentine's Day, which is a – or the day after. And then I'll be – I think it's it's February 15th. I'll be in West Nyack at the Big Ass Mall. Please come to that. I'll be at the Albany Funny Bone February 18th. I love that room. Yeah? Yeah. It's wild. Um. I uh, so so check me out. I I have some. I've I, by now I've announced the Australia tour. Um. We'll see. Cool. They, they said. They said. Uh. They said you only make money in Australia. Your third tour there. Oh my God. And I'm like Jesus <laughs> fucking Christ. What the fuck? Comedy is always. There's always levels where you're like you're not gonna make any money. But the third tour, oh. Australia, figure out your dollar. Come right now, it's, it's not comparing well. It's like 0. 0.64 of the U.S. dollar. So oh. imagine like a, a tough, that's brutal. <laughs> so please uh, uh, join the Patreon, patreon.com slash downside. We will be back with Russell uh, next week. And uh, also the other big things coming up. Uh, uh, Netflix is a joke. I will be uh, May 2nd. Um, it's, it's getting closer to being sold out. So buy those tickets now if you're in L.A., um and uh, uh Lori, I you're such a great comic. I, I admire your your work so much. So thank you for doing this. Thank you, so are you. And uh, uh thank you for keeping the jokes dark. Yeah. Even even if it's on hopefully the right side of history. <laughs> Hope history remembers me kindly. Oh, this is the downside. <laughs> The Downside. The Downside. With John Marco Cerezi. Tell him, Russell. Subscribe to The Downside right now. Where? Down here. Or here. We don't know, but just do it. Or also, what else could they do? They could follow the Patreon. They could subscribe to the Patreon. Ah, no! Patreon.com. Too much pressure.